Since my last tank review was on the M1 Abrams, a somewhat misunderstood tank with legendary status, I figured that Israel's Merkava main battle tank would be a good choice for a second episode. Given that it's in a similar position, just like with the last video, I'm going to start off by explaining the Merkava's history, before giving my overall opinion. So without further ado, let's get started. In 1966, two British chieftain tanks were received by Israel for testing. This was fairly significant for the IDF Armored Corps, as the chieftain was brand new, and they were desperate to get a leg up on the T-54s and T-55s used by their enemies. In addition to the lengthy trials, the Israelis also drew up an extensive list of recommendations and modifications they would want to see on the chieftain, if they were to purchase it after all. Unfortunately, the advent of the Six-Day War in 1967 caused Britain to pull out of the deal. The IDF was, understandably, pretty soured by this ordeal. This wasn't the first time that the acquisition of foreign equipment had fallen through. The IDF refused to give Britain their list of modifications, and began preparing to design their own main battle tank. It had become apparent that they couldn't rely on foreign powers, and that given their unique circumstances as a nation, it was probably best to design a tank that was specifically suited to their situation. The program didn't begin in earnest until 1970, headed by the legendary Major General Israel Talik Tau. Talik had experienced fighting in three wars, and was practically responsible for forging the IDF's armored doctrine. Before the designs were laid out, the name of the new tank had already been chosen. The new tank would be called Merkava, or Chariot and would primarily use Israeli materials and technology. Getting approval for the project had been an arduous process, but it was spurred forward when it became apparent that the Soviet Union would be shipping thousands of its T-62 main battle tanks to Israel's enemies. It was decided that the crew would be the focal point for the program. The IDF could afford to repair and replace tanks, but replacing crew members was a different story entirely. Not only was crew safety paramount, but so was their comfort. While the Merkva project was underway, the War of 1973 was raging. Therein, the IDF Armored Corps fought off Egyptian T-55s and T-62s with their shot cows and magoks, modified Centurions and Patons. Though their defense was successful, the IDF Armored Corps suffered heavy losses. Of the 2,500 Israeli soldiers lost in the war, the majority were tankers. For the relatively small nation, these losses were unacceptable. They simply could not afford to lose so many experienced tankers not when a new conflict in the near future was almost certain. These heavy losses further drove home the Merkava's emphasis on crew survivability. At this point, composite armor was in its infancy, and Israel didn't yet have the time, money, or ability to produce it. This presented a problem, as increasing raw armor thickness wasn't a practical solution either. The Merkava designers came up with a novel solution. Instead of increasing the armor itself, every component of the Merkava would be geared towards the survival of the crew. The power pack will be placed in the front along with a fuel tank. Fuel is actually fairly effective at stopping high explosive anti-tank rounds. The Swedes took note of this on the STRV-103, using jerry cans filled with fuel as a type of side armor. The Merkava's turret would also make extensive use of spaced armor, increasing its ability to protect the crew from heat-based weaponry. In addition to the spaced armor, the Merkava's turret presented a very unappealing target from the front. It was relatively narrow, and heavily angled along every aspect. In addition to providing protection for the crew, placing the power pack in the front allowed for the Merkava to have more free space overall. This free space was used to stow more ammunition, and to place a door at the rear of the vehicle. This door allowed for the crew to escape quickly in the case of an emergency, and also allowed for the Merkava to be resupplied while under fire. The extra room theoretically allowed for the Merkava to act as an ambulance for casualties, evacuating them safely using its armor and firepower. The Merkava was finally unveiled in May of 1979, during Israel's anniversary celebrations. Of course, its unveiling was rife with propaganda. The IDF proudly claimed that the Merkava was the best tank in the world, and displayed it offloading 10 fully equipped dismounts. In reality, even with all of the ammunition removed, the Merkava could barely hold 6 riflemen in a practical fashion. The Merkava weighed 63 tons, had a 900 horsepower diesel engine, and was armed with the 105mm M68, with a total of 62 rounds available. The Merkava wouldn't see combat until June of 1982, during Operation Peace for Galilee, in which the IDF crossed into Lebanon, hoping to destroy the Palestinian military elements therein. The Syrian military wasn't too keen on that plan, so they also joined in on the fighting. It's here that the Merkava earned its reputation. Its unique armor layout proved to be very effective in stopping RPGs and ATGMs. The biggest threat the Merkava faced was the T-72, and even then, it came out the victor. During the war in Lebanon, seven Merkavas were destroyed, with an unknown number being damaged. Not only did the Merkava prove to be an effective fighting machine, but it fulfilled its main goal brilliantly. Among Merkava crews, casualties were slim, especially when compared to other tanks fielded by the IDF. Though the Merkava performed well during the war in Lebanon, its designers weren't content to call it a day. 
They started by interviewing Merkava crews, asking what their problems with the tank were, and what they liked about it. Taking these lessons into account, they designed the Merkava Mark II, which incorporated more armor for the turret, chain armor on the back to protect it from heat warheads, an improved laser rangefinder, an improved fire control system, a new transmission, and they moved the external mortar inside the vehicle. The Mark III and Mark IV variants would implement further upgrades to the Merkava's power plant, armor, fire control systems, and more. Starting with the Mark III, the Merkava began using a 120mm gun. The IDF considered producing the American M256 under license, but it was decided that the 120mm should be designed and produced in Israel. It would have been difficult for the arms industry to switch over from 105 ammo to 120 ammo, so the cannon was designed to fire the same type of ammo as the M256. That way, if the IDF ever found themselves in need of ammunition, they could simply buy more from the United States. If you were to look at the Merkava, and directly compare it to tanks that came out around the same time, Tanks like the M1 Abrams and Leopard 2, it would obviously seem pretty lackluster. In terms of mobility and armor protection, the Merkava lags behind, but a direct comparison really isn't that fair. The Merkava was the first tank that Israel ever produced on its own. It was specifically tailored to their needs, whereas something like the Leopard 2 is more of a multi-role design, intended for use in a variety of environments, and supposed to be exported for profit. Israel simply didn't have the means, or the inclination, to produce something like that. The location of the Merkava's power pack is probably the most heavily criticized aspect of its design, with people saying that it's useless as armor, because a shot to the front will disable the engine right away. Ignoring that, in order for that to happen, the round would have to hit the relatively unexposed lower front plate. At the time the original Merkava was produced, the enemies of the IDF didn't have any weapons capable of penetrating the relatively well-sloped upper front plate. The problem is that people look at it from the standpoint that armor is meant to protect the tank. The power pack being in the front isn't meant to protect the tank from harm. It's meant to protect the crew. Some people also claim that the engine exhaust can interfere with the Merkava's thermal sight. This sounded off to me, so I asked a Merkava crewman if this was true. He said it was complete nonsense. The Merkava is misunderstood by people that despise it and by people that love it. It's not useless, but it's not the best tank in the world either. Despite this, the Merkava is the best tank for Israel. I suspect that much of the Merkava's success can be attributed to the skill of its crews rather than the tank itself. But the Merkava certainly deserves some praise for its design. And that's pretty much all I want to say on the subject. If you guys thought the video was informative, leaving a like or comment helps out a lot. As always, hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you on the next one.